Pake. Okay. <laughs> All right. Pierre, Kyle, and we got a special, special interview today. Yes, we have two very special guests. I will have introduced themselves. My name is Jeffrey Burant. I'm a comics writer and performer. And yeah, my career in comics, I first got published in 2005 or so. I moved to New York to get an MFA in fiction writing, which I did, and then kind of ingrained myself in the New York comic scene. I had a series of comics run in Details Magazine, and I was self-publishing the sci-fi adventures of my real-life rock rock band Americans UK. And from that, I was able to get a deal from Oni Press. So the Americans UK was more adult. There were drugs and cursing and stuff. And I kind of did like the teen friendly version for Oni Press, where it was a group of teens and a punk band who had sci-fi adventures. And then it went from there. And I don't know, someone publishes me one way or another about once a year, whether it's an anthology or a book. And now we have Ghost Planet with my buddy, Sean. That was me passing the baton to you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> and what a large baton this is. <laughs> Hello, this is Shoman Gorman of Comics. I've been working in comics for about just a little over 10 years now. I'm best known for such indie darlings as Toe Tag Riot. That was uh, originally put out through Black Mask Studios. Pawn Shop, which I co-created with Joey Esposito. My first book was Secret Adventures of Houdini. Currently, I'm working on Ghost Planet with my good buddy Jeff coming out through Scout Comics October 19th. You can also see my work in the last comic book on the left. I just had some work come out in the Lower Your Sights anthology through Mad Gift Studios. And later this fall, you'll see a couple of covers I did for a couple of the Star Trek books for IDW. I did a cover for Star Trek Picard, Stargazer number three, which will be the final issue, as well as issue two of Star Trek Resurgence, which is an official tie-in of the video game that's coming out later this year. Very nice. Very nice. So being we're in the space kind of horror genre here, since we're going to focus on Ghost Planet in just a few minutes, I kind of wanted to see what you two like in the genre as far as books, movies, TV. Just take turns naming some of your favorites. Sure. You go first, Sean. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that baton again. So massive. I'm a fan of anything of John Carpenter. I do enjoy the Stranger Things show on the Netflix. Honestly, I'm more of a comedy guy. No one is more surprised than I that I work on so many horror books. I can't think of the movie. Where it was Lawrence Fishburne and Jurassic Park English dude discover a ghost ship where there's lots of scary, gory stuff on board. Is that the one with the wire that goes through everybody? I mean, it's very gory. Event Horizon. Never saw it. Uh, it's good. I mean, it's not a great movie, but it's a very good B-movie horror space movie, which you don't get a lot, except for, I guess, John Carpenter has some, like you've mentioned, Sean. This book, Ghost Planet, is very heavily influenced by John Carpenter movies, I would say. We kind of took a classic sci-fi look and sci-fi story and added kind of a body horror twist, which I think, you know, adds to the suspense. Word. Surprised no one said aliens. Just so Alien, that. aliens. <laughs> a little biased, because that's my favorite. Yeah, well, so which of those first two, do you have a favorite of Alien or Aliens? Yeah. Or movies so they're equal almost. i'd go just the first it's definitely anything more after that movie. yeah the only thing with alien the first one is it it hasn't aged well so like it doesn't scare me i'd like to see that movie maybe revamped again all right so my question living on a new planet who's your comic creator crew and why uh chris uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's got the weed um, uh, <laughs> dean haspiel because he's got the whiskey he'll take his shirt off even without a request D- yeah it's already off hi dean <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening i tag dean whenever we name drop him in a podcast Sean and I are assuming we're both on this shit together. We could probably use some feminine additions to the team. Let's not all bro down. Hey, how about an editor? How about an editor? Yeah. I mean, well, as editor. artists, we're all going to die very quickly. It's so it's stupid <laughs> to have all comic creators. That's what <laughs> <laughs> Dean's going to take us out first. That's why he keeps a crew of younger talent that he can just, you know, devour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dean sounds like he's going to be the cannibal. Good uh, choice. Editor, Sean, were you thinking Heather Antos? Is that why you brought up editor? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. If we can get her, sure. If she would yeah, agree she, to yeah, join might, us. She might be on another yeah. escape pod. We were all presumably on the same ship at some point. So it's possible we were all at the same party on a ship. Did we go on a voyage? Did we plan a three-hour tour together? A Comic-Con <laughs> in 2030. Yeah. So I think the Comic-Con, that was the original party, and it unfortunately blew up. So now everyone had to leave on escape pods and you're you're heading towards a planet. 
And uh, yeah, yeah, she could have been on a different pod or the same pod. It depends on really her schedule and whether she wants to be on the same pod with you or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Join a planet with Sean or pilot into the sun. I'll take my friend Laura Lee Gulledge. She's an amazing cartoonist living in Virginia now, I believe, who has coined the term artner so she can be an artner at the Space Comic Con disaster. Keep in mind, you're leaving behind a lot of people. You're to name all the people we want to jettison. <laughs> you're taking like five or six but <laughs> it's a really small escape pod if we got to it everyone else perished time walter simonson gets what he deserves he's out of here <laughs> he's notoriously like the sweetest man in comics <laughs> he'll pay for his crimes <laughs> I'm going to clip that and send that to him. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just come in with us. Yeah, I have this at Baltimore Comic Con. I, I got to meet Walt Simonson once, a couple times actually. But that year they were giving away crab hammers, right? So I got him to sign my crab hammer. I remember that. You showed me that that year. On that same year, I was having lunch with Amy Chu at that spot across the street. We had just rolled in like <laughs> right before like the lunch rush. They put us down at this grossly large table. This was like a table for eight for a party of two. And then we just see this huge line out the door. I was like, oh, wow, this is great. We got here just in time. And we see Walt Simonson and Wheezy out in line waiting to get in. And we're like, oh, no, this isn't going to work. So we poked our heads like, Walt, Wheezy, come in. We have space at our table. Come on in. <laughs> and then they brought their entourage. And then we just had this big meal with Walt, Wheezy, Amy Chu, and a friend of theirs. I don't remember his name, but he did most of the talking. Very cool table. And Baltimore's cool. Baltimore's a great Comic-Con if you ever get the chance to go. I uh, went yeah. last year. This year I can't go, but Jeremiah, our co-host, he'll be handling press there for us. So Cool. Come oh, sweet. Yeah. We're guests. On and I are we are guests. guests. New York, I will see you guys, though. We got yeah, pressed we'll... for the first time, actually. Nice. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. Now that we've fluffed a bunch and asked <laughs> you some nonsense, before we get to more nonsense later, because I do have a little plan at the end, let's get the Ghost Planet synopsis. So, it's a family of deep space explorers must solve the mystery of Ghost Planet before their dead loved ones return to kill them next. I think that's our log line. Does not end well. Yeah, it's a 40-page done-in-one graphic novella which i think is important so you get a full meal you get a full story i think it also because of that has a bit of an evergreen property for retailers they can sell it over months and years like a trade and so sean and i are both super proud of this one and excited for more people to get to read it yeah we got a chance to get a little sneak peek at it yeah, we both enjoyed it thoroughly it's a unique story but still captures that kind of space horror did either of you cry well, i wasn't gonna talk about it but <laughs> <laughs> being you <That's>... asked <laughs> That's why we do this. We just want to see the response. <laughs> yeah. We're just trying to make people feel something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I needed it, though, so I appreciate it. You know, I really, it was built up for a while, and then Pierre came over, and then he cried, too, and it was the yeah. whole thing. It was a very nice moment. We hugged yeah. each other, laid on the couch. Yep. Contemplated your own mortality. He yep. held my baton, I held his. <laughs> good time but yeah what type of material is this book coming in what do we got talk about the paper it'll be printed on reclaimed trees all right nice nice okay. i mean there's going to be lots of different covers so we've got a mike and laura allard cover that's a one in ten variant we've got a tess fowler one in 50 glow in the dark variant we've oh i don't think i saw that one they have variants that haven't been announced yet scout is super cool and it's kind of fun to, to be a part of something with a lot of variants just as a fan, you know, and to get cool covers from amazing artists. So that kind of brings us a little bit to the next question. How did you two end up together on this project? Jeff and I have worked together a few times in the past. We have done a lot of anthology work. We did a short called Rainbow Boy for the Love is Love anthology for DC IDW a couple of years ago that I ended up winning the Eisner for best anthology that year. So, you know, not to flex, but Jeff and I, between the two of us, have an eighth of 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 an Eisner. So not nothing. That's and, something. And this was maybe like a couple of days after lockdown. So both home with our families and we're contemplating the future of what it is we do because we're figuring, oh, well, cons aren't a thing anymore. So that's out the door. How do we get our work out to people? And then Jeff had hit me up. He had had this concept he'd been working on since college called Ghost Planet. He had uh, reached out to me and it was not a hard sell at all because I was kind of like getting squirrely and, and climbing the walls in my apartment looking for something to do. 
as well as being just completely terrified about the future and contemplating the mortality of going out in the world and breathing the poisoned air. So yeah, Comic Project was a really up my alley. Sean, I forgot about this. We were about to embark on our secret project that is always on the back burner for us. So we were about to start that and instead we pivoted because all of a sudden that Webtoons contest came up and then I went, whoa, ho, wait, we got to hop on this because the secret project is, well, let's just start to make this in the background and eventually we'll be done. We can make it as slow as we want. And then we totally pivoted and made something very quickly instead, <laughs> which we made this whole 40 page comic in a month, maybe. Oh, wow. It was a tight turnaround. The contest had called for a 40 page short in like a webtoon scrolling format. So that was the original format of this. It was designed to be like a scrolling webtoon type of thing. And we had this unprecedented unprecedented moment where we had unlimited time kind of just focus on one thing for a while because Jeff and I both have day jobs outside of comics. We both have families. And this was a moment where we had a couple of months off to just stay home and kind of focus on our craft for a little bit, as well as have it be a distraction from our own mortality. So a lot of the challenges were to figure out how I was going to do this because all the interior stuff is me. I did the line art, I colored it, I lettered it and laid it out. And Jeff was, you know, writing scripts in real time of he had a rough concept, but then he was pumping out like one chapter a week. And I was just getting pages on a Monday and having completed pages by the next Monday. Somehow quickly made decisions as to how to make this book work, be aesthetically pleasing and make it not seem like it was rushed. So we decided to take a certain artistic licenses with like things like the color and the line art. Everything about this project was a departure. This was trying new things and getting this done quickly because I am notorious for taking my time with things. And I just thought it'd be great to say, hey, what if we just had a book done in a month? Right. And we had these deadlines from Webtoons. You know, you had to submit once a week by Sunday night or something. And then we got snagged up. They censored us. You know, we have a corpse on a table early on. Sean was smart and used like the autopsy lamp to cover his baton, if you will. Webtoons saw it as a censorship bar because they allow like natural coverage of nudity like you can use smoke or say an autopsy lamp to cover but because it was square they do not allow like you can't do a punk rock censorship bar over a nipple that's their line so they shut down the whole series while we're trying to update in real time and that kind of like knocked the wind out of our sails but we still finished and then we had a finished project to pitch around which i think is obviously very helpful in the way to go really because Unless you're a known entity, I think the days of here's a pitch page and five pages of finished story are kind of done unless you know an editor, at least on cold submission. I feel like any publishers need at least like three issues finished or a finished project to say yes or no to. So we had that and it worked. We had more than one publisher say yes. And so we got to pick Scout. I felt really good. Now, this is your first time working with Scout? This was totally a cold submission via their website. Awesome. How would you say it is working with them so far? I've read some things by them. They've been publishing a lot of great stuff. Yeah, they have a great structure in place with guidelines that are helpful. It's a lot smaller team than you might realize in the background. And so a lot of responsibility falls on few people. And that said, they do an amazing job, especially during the pandemic. They've really found themselves, I think, with selling direct to customers. So, you know, I feel like as indie comics creators, what you're looking for in a comics publisher is basically a distributor. And so that is where I think Scout really shines. It was very refreshing. When we had our first meeting, they had set us up with an editor and they were very direct and upfront with what they knew they could do, ideas of what they thought they could do, and were open to ideas of what can we do? Because Jeff and I have both been doing this for a while. We have our contact with stores. We've had to hustle an indie book once or twice in our day and having Scout's resources to pull with that. A lot of times you work with an indie publisher and they kind of try to go for a mafia, so puppet master type of thing where they're trying to like, you know, have you be the spider and everyone's on their way and they're doing deals that you can't even comprehend or even answer an email, which just hasn't been the case. Everyone's been very friendly and helpful from every 
everywhere. And we're very excited to be showing with them at New York Comic Con. We're supposed to be premiering an exclusive cover for the show and doing signings at their booth. We're told there's going to be a big printout poster size of our cover as part of their display. I don't think I've ever been more excited for New York Comic Con. Yeah, that's true. We will be visiting you. Definitely want that exclusive. So Jeff, what sparked the idea for this story? I know you kind of touched on it. I'd had this idea since college, but just from the term Ghost Planet, like I sketched out at the time based on that name, what you see in the book now, a planet with a continent that looks vaguely like a skull. It was just like a pulp novel idea that kind of drew out this 60s type cover. And then my brain just for years kept circling on like, well, what would this story be? How do we get to a ghost planet? I think one of the things I like to explore is I'm much more lean towards sci-fi than fantasy as far as what I enjoy and like to write. And so I kind of took what I think of as like the Richard Matheson approach to I Am Legend, where it's coming up, one of the things he does in that is come up with a biological reason for vampires. And so I was kind of trying to come up with a way, how do we get ghosts without a fantastical element? And that's, I would say, the launch point of this story. And then the other side of that, so I had originally written this, like I said, I moved to New York to get an MFA in fiction writing. And so I wrote a lot more prose. And so this was originally a prose short story. So it was also about me exploring what would be a Korean family in space and through research and friends trying to capture that family family dynamic of Korean American friends that I'd grown up with and then that just translated to the ported right over to the comic but without a narrator I think you may lose some of the context I was trying to build with the short story but with the art covers that in itself you know and the idea of it was this family separated out from a generational ship that you never get to meet but that they have a mission to try to find a home for this generational ship that's just flying through space so it's funny the skull planet I didn't even notice it at first <laughs> I'm just like that was a red flag right there <laughs> well, we had an early review that was like their one problem with it. It was like, how come this family didn't think, hey, there's a planet with skull? And it's like, well, but if this happened in real life, you wouldn't think that that was a real meaningful symbol. Right. You yeah. would think, oh, it just happens to look like that. Yeah. If you're flying it from space, it doesn't mean you're looking at it straight on. You're probably yeah. upside down by the time you get there. And to your point, I mean, with the art and the way it transitions as they're getting closer, I didn't register it at all that there was a skull <laughs> on that planet. So it was very well done on both aspects of it. I did want to take a second to compliment the art, though. I think your style, I don't know if there's a category it would fit in, but it is very refreshing and it really, truly fit the story so perfectly. It set the vibe. No other art style would have fit that story. Also, the color hues changing by panel. That was a nice touch, too. I don't think I've seen anything quite like that, where it almost set the mood of each panel. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, a lot of this art for this project was definitely a departure. I think for sure, as we were doing this in lockdown at the height of the pandemic, a lot of our feelings of insecurities and our fears, our feelings of isolation and being isolated with your family, with illness being a factor, these moods definitely worked its way into the DNA of the project for sure. A lot of it was also time. There were conscious decisions to figure out how we were going to make this 40-page book in 30 days and still have it be a full book. Because for me, coloring and lettering are not my go-to skills. There are things I can do, but it just takes me longer to do them because I'm not conditioned to do the work of a proper colorist. My focus is more on the line art and the storytelling of the pen and ink drawings. So I wanted to have it be more expressive with the line art, large brush strokes, probably going for more of like a Japanese style in terms of using the brush pens I was using. And then also having it be very subtle, not overly detailed, figuring in terms of the time, let's just get the mood and the moment on there. And then for the color, we figured there's not a lot of time. Let me just throw one color down. And then we had like four or five colors for the book and then each color would dictate the mood of the panel and then we would have these themes we can keep coming back to we had this deep crimson red for horror you know we had like a lighter red for like when things were going down there was like this blue for the depressing moments and then the screen for the pensive anxious moments and then you know a nice yellow for the few happy pages we have on there 
and then we are able to jump back on there and then we can we can help guide the reader to see how they're supposed to be feeling and reading it again it's been a while since i looked at it properly but also the color i think also lends to kind of like the sound like the soundtrack of what this horror book would be this red tone to be like the horror note that would pop up like the things are bad now yeah i really thought it was a brilliant solution by sean i think it really elevates the book and and makes it kind of just artier in some way because it really does punch through with emotion that you know removes the need for caption boxes where you're listening to the first person narration so that you know how anxious they are in that moment or what have you and the color decisions does that for you and i also found it interesting once we started to move through the book and once he had established that while we were working then we got to use it as a tool more i like to talk about how sometimes we also use it to denote time or even light sources there's a moment when our young protagonist is using speech to turn off lights and so we get to go from the blue color and then down to purple and then back on to blue from the purple when she says lights on again and it really kind of helps with the timing of that page almost and then there's another scene a particularly horrific cliffhanger scene early on where a woman is walking into this alien forest and it's scary and then you turn the page and everything is yellow and there's two suns in the sky and then when they start talking you realize okay it's the next morning but we didn't have to say meanwhile or sometime later the next morning because the colors just communicated that and by then that was on purpose it was like hey sean i just wrote this morning scene i think we'll turn this one yellow so that we communicate that i give you guys credit it really is a cool book yeah i think that's a perfect way to describe it i think it Almost just like what you're saying, Sean, it almost felt like a music note with every color change. You really grasp the emotion on each of those. And I actually know specifically the scene you're talking about of where it does feel like it went to morning and everything's mm -hmm. bright and beautiful. And then they run into some debauchery. <laughs> hey, maybe <laughs> right we'll get out of this. this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually funny. So that scene, right, where it's all bright and sunny, I think is essentially a scene where we start kind of diving into this whole mess that they're about to encounter. There's a creature that you introduce in this. You oh, asked this question. I saw it. I was like, oh, they have a yeah. name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And for the readers, when you do get to it, weird armadillo looking ones. In the script, they were called space pigs. That's what I came up with. Mm. And I think that was the description given to Sean. It was like space pigs. And then when they approach, their armor needs to open up. And then you get to see that kind of toothy maw. The idea was, and this was always from the beginning of the story, we have this alien environment where basically some sort of pollen may be floating around. And so the idea was that when the first animals they see, they don't see orifices. And then you might understand if you're thinking in terms of natural selection, by the time you get to the end and you might want to read it again, and then you might figure out, oh, that's why none of the animals that they see have orifices and why when the space pig eats or whatever, it actually unseals kind of alien style to do those processes. I love biology. So figuring out that sort of stuff is what I enjoy adding to a script. No, you definitely got the space pig. And then the noise they make is wordle, wordle, wordle. I wordle. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where that came from. It's funny, the sound effects that you use, it was well done, and I think it was the first time I've ever seen anyone write wordle. Well, it was as, also before as, uh, that game, too, that hadn't existed yet that I know of, so that was okay. like an accidental convergence there. I think you take credit for it. I think wordle is really what a space pig sounds like, not yeah. a popular game. New York Times owes me big. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a very well-known known fact that the creation of the sound effects that you see in a comic is where writers really do their best and hardest work. Most of their focus <laughs> on the project is on the sound of this. And they focus more on this than on pretty much any other part of it, but they get usually typically the least credit of it because people just like kind of like gleam over it and just go back to the dialogue. And it brightens their day when you point out the sound effect that they decided on. <laughs> yeah. Between the sound effect and the design, I really did think it was a space pig. I also could have seen a hippo just based off the aggression, but pig, a warthog, a hippo, they all have that chunky look, yeah. but yeah, very well done. When I have to design a creature, I always try to go to biology of creatures that exist and kind of maybe throw some things around. I think there was definitely a little bit of hippo DNA in there. 
Yeah. Maybe if like a hippo's mouth on a pig's body and the mouth is sideways. Also, I think we had found, because we were sending images back and forth, I think, and there's a dinosaur like with a really heavy cranium and those, that kind of ridging. So I think that got worked in. Oh, um, yeah, that's right. Because we were kind of looking for what the creature's face slash non-face was. To your point, I mean, you mentioned other creatures that were on the planet and I did notice them. I'll tell you, there's birds. And if you think about it, they provide the stock with orifices that the space pigs cannot. Probably the, the final horrific scene, if you look amongst the carcasses, it's a bunch of those little birds because they're the ones that would be affected otherwise. Without humans entering the biome, they're the ones that allow the other creatures. It's so hard to talk about without spoiling. I don't think anyone dies. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Yeah, they're, just, they're just ghosts on this planet, yo. So the next uh, question is funny because Pierre texted me, when's like the next one? Like, I know we have to wait for this one now because we read it early, but like, when's the next one? I'm like, no, it's a one shot. Like, no, it's not. He's like, no, no, no. When's the next one? Pierre, if you want to ask your question now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I read this. I had no idea that it was a one shot or anything. He sent it to me. We have sure. this interview. Read it. I was like, all right, cool. Like, read the book. And I really was like sitting there, like, okay, cool. Like, what is this developing? Is there something like happening? What's going to happen to her? I want to know more. <laughs> so the question so really upset. is. <laughs> This can't be the end. There has to be some sort of continuation. And you mentioned the people on the ship that were going to go help that you don't really see or hear about, yeah. really. They were on the starship Bravery. Bravery? So this can't be the end. Like, we have to know what happens to the people. Like, what's going to happen to them? If this is a success that demands a sequel, there are definite sequel ideas already fomenting that also kind of reflect the post lockdown world that also sort of inspired this comic so yes it would definitely continue i also think per our conversation about alien versus aliens it would kind of follow that same model i don't think we could pull off what we pulled off in part one again and so i think it would have to kind of change the dynamic about what's happening introduce probably more alien species into this biome so that there's more for more people to do because i don't think we're going to be able to pull off our twists again without, you know, introducing some new story elements. What I'm so proud about this 40 pager, and when I think about to how we made it, even though I had the story developed in, in my head from years prior, which is why I pitched you, because I knew we could work on it faster. Hey, I have the beginning, I have the end, and we'll figure out the middle here. But like to your question about the Starship Bravery, Pierre, the short story started there. So you got more of their life as they prepped to go on this exploration. And there were scenes with the parents like teaching their kids what they had to do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 and so it started there and you got more, uh, a bigger picture of the society that was at stake, but that all kind of had to be cut. We didn't have time to start there. We had to start with them getting there. And then it just becomes about sort of gesturing towards the starship bravery with their conversation. I would love to see what happened prior to even further what's going on with the people on the ship what created this world why are they even there right why are they looking for planets and then the after the fact they gotta go looking for them that so would be the idea yeah let's get it bring, done. bring more victims to ghost planet if the fans say they need another one we will make another one but to that point, if you are listening, today is Monday. So today is actually the final cutoff date for when you can go to your local comic retailer and pre-order your copy of Ghost Planet. You can simply go down to your favorite comic store, look the retailer dead in the eye and say, I fucking want this. Give them some money. And then in about a month, they will have a crisp new copy of Ghost Planet for you. We have three glorious covers of being put out through Diamond and Lunar. We have our Diamond A done by myself. We have a 110 variant by the legendary Mike and Laura Allred. And most exciting, there's a 150 variant uh, that'll probably be hard to get that is a glow-in-the-dark variant by none other than one of the toughest ladies in town, Ms. Tess Fowler. And we're both very excited about that glow-in-the-dark cover. I cannot wait to see that and play around with that in the dark with a flashlight. And you could too, if you act quickly. Today's Monday morning, you know, leave work early, get to your comic shop, call them on the phone, do what you gotta do. Find us Bro online. Sean made these coupons that we're sharing around. You can just print that out and tick off a box and hand it to them. If you're not good with confrontation, yeah, you can just take one of our coupons, write your name on it, and just leave it with some money. Now this brings us to something that we do. So do you want to introduce it? Yes, primarily we are audio, which is a great point for this because this is a 
slideshow. <laughs> the game is not as much of a game as more of the fun part of having you two take turns describing what you're seeing and then trying to guess what it is. And with that, I bring you... Oh my god, it's time for CD! Queers made up of aliens, horror, and spice. That is an intro <laughs> that sticks with you for a while. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be with me till tomorrow, which is Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday is tomorrow. Ah, uh, yes, Tuesday. That wine is great in the like, morning. It sounds like Billy Madison on Valium. Yeah, fear this voice. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we do it again. We can do it again. We do it again. You don't have to. Ooh, that no, was yeah. okay. <laughs> it always goes back down to that. It's just like, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> back to school. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have a separate meeting after this. So it's okay. Shampoo is better. So if anyone knows what scene it is, apparently it's this website where they show you one scene from a movie. And you have to guess the movie. This wasn't yeah. my idea. Now we're all seeing this, and we're describing it also. Yes, please. House. Okay, I immediately <laughs> recognize what movie this is. Oh, good. This is and easy. I what I would describe as a monolith and an old person in bed. Okay. Door without a knob. Show Table from Ikea. The Michael Jackson Billy Jean floor as if though he stepped on every panel at once. Oh, that's good. Much better descriptions than I was expecting. When like you feel you furniture. That was my favorite. When you feel you'd described enough, please make your guesses. I'm going to say this is 2001 The Space Odyssey. And we are correct. Woo-hoo. You get one. a point or something. $100 yeah. okay. Canadian. I think one of my favorite movies, if mm-hmm. I'm right it correctly let's get a description of head being split by an alien sort of hammerhead shark say very nice that if i remember correctly does not actually have eyes Mm, see what i did there i don't know what he did i see a pair of rich slack (laughs) i see okay here what i did that baton (laughs) all right any guesses Pitch Black. All right. I love Pitch Black. I saw it in the theater. All right. We're doing good. Okay. Ooh. This is sort of a gourd-like cabeza of some kind. Something you would see outside of someone's house. It looks as if it's looking right before Thanksgiving, after putting it out for Halloween. I see what might be a pair of hanging breasts the top of some hanging breasts. Maybe this is some sort of clone gone wrong. And with that, it is? Alien 4 Resurrection. Yeah. All right. We're doing good. Ah, this has come up in conversation in a way this morning. It's a, a very phallic piece. Yes, it is. Got some monstrous teeth. We got some body horror, as I've heard it described. Some goo dripping. Ooh. A good band for the soundtrack would have been the Carpenters, oh. but I believe this particular Carpenter did his own score. This heavily influenced a little book called Ghost Planet. It's called The Thing. The Thing, yes. In fact, Sean, you never replied to me. I want to do a, well, I want you to do. <laughs> <laughs> a cover of the thing but with like the dad that movie cover reference if we ever get the chance to do another variant let's open that up right now guys sean why didn't you respond the last x chain i recall <laughs> was your project to get matching space helmets which i believe yes. was resolved I, yes i ordered it it'll be here on sunday one caveat to that jeff i did some modifications on mine yours is going to come with some weird patches and stripes i actually got the visor off and i spray painted this white so it was more like the book oh okay mm. wow pretty that's solid nice. helmet that's high quality That's why I was unsure. That's why I had to send you a picture of like, is this the right one? Because I noticed the details are different. So if we're cropping images for the TikTok, these would be the ones. Yes, you drink a mine through a space helmet. I'm impressed that you're doing this successfully. Hey, did yeah. anyone see the thing remake? I did not. No, I refused. I didn't even know there was yeah, a remake. I didn't even see the original, to be honest with you. I think you don't touch. That's one of them. For sure. I agree. <laughs> this thing creeps me out a lot. I'm not going to lie to you. I've been staring at it on the screen and I'm glad it's gone now. It's got some Kurt Russell in there, so. Yeah. Very off-putting. Ah, I know this one. That is Vin Diesel. The actor (laughs) Vin Diesel. He's saying, Family! I see what is probably some milky blood. Oh, it's um, milky, all right. A giant of sorts sitting out off the head of a humanoid that doesn't look actually human. My problem is I'm not sure of which of the two this is. This is Vin mm. Diesel versus Magneto. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. This is Prometheus. <laughs> Very good. No, there wasn't there a second Prometheus or something? Well, it wasn't there called was... Prometheus, though. Yeah, yeah. It was called Prometheus. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, I remember. Promethei. <laughs> Promethei. <laughs> okay. Wait. Oh, what the fuck is this? <laughs> The reaction is incredible. What the fuck is this? I think that's all you need to say about it. 
this is basically me on the J train. What the fuck is this <laughs> coming on? All right, we got a face oh. on a dog. I think <laughs> this is a trick. I don't think uh, I've seen this movie, but I want to. I don't know if the thing or this is more off-putting. This, well, I, I want this off this, my screen. Oh, well, he's this, picking his own nose with his tongue. Isn't this from the thing? It is not, and I'm upset because there was a GIF of this of him moving, and I couldn't get it to work in the PowerPoint. And the GIF was so much more disturbing. Um, this belongs in Men in Black. Ass. I don't want to know. Take, Take it away. away. It's dog man comic. <laughs> I'll tell you what like, you want to know. I feel like this is what the original design was for the pug in Men in Black. All right, are we going to give up on this one? It is Invasion of the Potty Snatchers. This version I did not see. The original is from the 50s, actually. Metaphor for communism and what was it when people were outed as being communists in Hollywood in the 50s? Black bald. The original Invasion of the Body Snatchers is black and white, 50s. That's the metaphor. Oh. Then it gets updated in the 70s. I mean, there's been like four of them now, I think. And then it gets updated with Donald Sutherland in the 70s. I'm going to take this off the screen. Okay, this is the last one. Mm. These look like crummy toys from 1984. Like the mm. one that you would get at the pharmacy as opposed to the toy store. Close. These like, were toys and they were from the 90s at one point. Oh, okay. Yeah, my mom definitely bought me these when I wanted Power Rangers. She was like, oh, here you go. You can have these. So, hey, okay, this is what you wanted. An action figure. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you, Grandma. It's space. a Blue Ranger. Yeah, this Thanks. is blue. Space and horror. This is more space. Space. It's obviously animated. I forgot this movie existed and I came across it by accident. I said, this will be the finale to stump them for real. I give you a little synopsis. I vaguely remember it. So they were trying to get to a new planet planet to make it the new earth and they had like a spaceship of seeds and whatnot to populate a new planet all right i win you might have gotten <laughs> right but i win was uh, matt damon in this not only matt damon but the counterpart was drew barrymore do i get partial points for knowing matt damon was in it <laughs> that is more impressive than knowing the movie actually so you now win the whole thing is this we bought a zoo all right now that you know i've wasted your whole monday morning oh my god i'm gonna get fired i got the kids on the bus wake up put milk in your cereal just grab a fistful and go the last thing we do want to open the floor to other projects past or present or future we love to hear things first so any secret projects you want to just tell us all about that's cool and then of course a final ghost planet plug and then where to follow you i'll let you two just take it away with all this information sure right now i've got a couple things coming out i have some work that just came out last wednesday the lower your sights anthology through mad cave studios to raise money for victims of the happening in the ukraine at the moment in a few weeks i'll have some covers this is my very first star trek cover this will be for the diamond b variant for Star Trek Picard Stargazer number three. I'm on the social media. You can follow me at Von Gorn Art on Twitter and Instagram. I'm also new artist on Zest World. So you can check out my profile on Zest World. We'll be putting out some new work there in a little bit. If you want to commission me for art, I'm right now taking commissions for New York Comic Con exclusively on Zest World. And I'll also be taking commissions for Baltimore Comic Con where I'll be a guest with Jeff as well as Dean Haspiel and in Whitney Matheson later in October. If you like what you saw today and you like what you heard and you want to see me scrawl on some Bristol for you and give it to you in real life, that's the way to do it. Well, I'll talk about all the books I'm going to have at our tables in the next month. So that sci-fi rock and roll comic I was talking about earlier from Oni Press, it's called Odd Schnoz and the Odd Squad. You can get it from Amazon, order it through your comic book store. Simon Schuster, you can order it directly because they distribute for Oni. By me, uh, co-creator Dennis Culver, who writes lots of Batman titles for DC these days. That's Odd Schnoz and the Odd Squad. If you find it online, my buddy Peter Boyko and I recorded a whole soundtrack for the record, including a song by the band. So we got, at the time, his 16-year-old niece to sing as Odd Schnoz herself because our characters are 15 and 16 in the book. We'll also have uh, Casio Cortez and the Freshman Force trade, which Sean and I have a story together in that from Devil's Do. That was one of our many short collabs. We have a couple of Rainbow Boy stories like Sean was talking about before. In the 101 Project, I'll have anthologies like Containment Breach. I have a story in that within the Containment Breach 2 anthology, which is this really cool anthology where they gave you prompts that you would then send to someone else around a theme. 
And so you would get this prompt from someone else. There was a time limit to write the story. Anyway, that's all to say it was very fun, a fun anthology to, to be a part of. I also have a story in the Twisting Time anthology that came out this year. It was a successful Kickstarter. There, uh, you can order it online. It's a 200 page anthology. Every story is about time travel and has a twist ending of sorts. And yeah, those are my main things. I was in the Odd Squad came out in 2015. We're finally in the black. So if you buy a copy, you know, 25 cents hits my uh, savings account every once in a while. So that's exciting. And then of course, Ghost Planet. That's what we want everyone to go today, hit that final order, cut off and find that Mike Allred cover, find that Tess Fowler cover, go to scoutcomics.com or whatever their website is. They'll, they'll have unique covers on there. I think they can't do vinyl covers right now because of the printer, but they do these things where they make covers out of the, the print stock of the sheets that they make. And it leaves like a line. It's almost like a panel in Ghost Planet, you know, it'll just be a single color because you get the red, the blue, the yellow plate when you're printing comics, right? And so they make a cover out of those four different plates. And so they're very rare. They sell them for a high dollar. Another reason why we're super excited to be at Scout. Go get Ghost Planet. It's going to hit stores October 19th. We're going to debut at New York Comic Con. It's going to be $5.99 for a done in one 40 page story, full meal. And yeah, I think it's a really cool story that will make you contemplate your life and how you should live a better one and be a better person. <laughs> I really lost my own thread there at the end. <laughs> no, I want to insult everyone at, at the same time. <laughs> well, thank you both again. Ghost Planet is fantastic. Great combination. The two of you together on that. It's very cool. And like you guys said, everyone needs to go and tell their comic shop that they want it today. Like right now. It's never too early to start joining up Oscar buzz for the Ghost Planet movie even before <laughs> the book is out. If you see some friends, you know, hashtag Ghost Planet movie. Make sure you get a copy for yourself by whatever means necessary. So you'll be rich later when there's a successful Matt Damon movie of the same name. Exactly. When they, when they whitewash our <laughs> Korean <laughs> characters <laughs> for Matt. Oh. Oh. He will fight the studio but, you know, at the end of the day. It's sad because it's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you. Thank you and fantastic job. Thank on... you, Kyle. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, guys. Well, I'll see you guys around the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, <laughs> there, bud. Tell my wife I love her oh, very much. Panel is podcast. <laughs> panel is <No>. podcast. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. What are we all drinking tonight? I have water. I just took some Thomas before the water. Okay. I have water also, so I cannot cheers by law. <laughs> This is tequila. Casa Amigos. I'm trying to keep it classy with a margarita mix. <laughs> Sean, what do you have? Got some red wine. Oh, nice. Wow. Okay, so extra classy. Paddle Pocket! It sounds like you put a bunch of potato chips on a keyboard and then just start typing away. Oh, that'd be a good show, too. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> Paddle Pocket! I can't remember. Let's just pretend that it was just that one thing, maybe. I don't know. You said something. It was brilliant. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go now. I'm sorry. It's gone. The baton is being taken from you instead of being passed. <laughs> yes, you. Take my baton. Battle pocket. My four-year-old is going to steal that thing. She loves glow-in-the-dark stuff, so she's going to steal it. Not a one in 50. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, she's not. <laughs> Battle pocket. Quick question. Are we recording the video as well? Mainly for clips for TikTok. Okay, cool. Because I've been realizing my body language has been like kind of laying about the place. <laughs> That's, That's, That's fun. That's fun. It's okay. So, I look like a jigsaw about to enter the scene and start <laughs> telling me I have a knife sewn into my stomach. Battle pocket. Wait, are we taking a tally? Our points are collated. We both win. They have collated their points. They are <laughs> both winning. Yes. Okay, fine then. I I'm just going to enjoy my wine. <laughs> I'm just having right. fun. I'm just like, oh, I know this movie. Okay. So, uh, the competitive <laughs> factor was important. I'm sorry. Just drinking my uh, Monday morning Pinot. 
<laughs> Battle Pocky. Uh, everyone noticed that Sean is still on screen, even though he yes. has left. He's made cardboard cutouts of himself, and those will be at our shared tables for when he leaves. Sean has returned. We were just talking about your cardboard cutout, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you, you'll be able to see this guy at Everyone Comics for their special NYCC preview night, along with Jeff. I'll put a little QR code that link to my portfolio. So basically be like I'm there. Yeah. Battle Pocket. I was the front man of a band for 15 years. Americans-UK.com. Check it out. We made some pretty kick-ass videos and comic book music videos where the lyrics are the dialogue and caption boxes. And kind of cool. through. So yeah, I love my own voice. <laughs> Battle Pocket. Hey, everybody, sorry I'm late. Here. Wow, I really didn't expect the dramatic entrance. Battle Pocky! So, any closing thoughts, any last words you'd like to share? Yeah, Jeff, last word. Uh, <laughs> you won't be on this earth. Can you hand there. me my salad tongs, please? <laughs> <laughs> You click them twice like a crab before you use them. Boy, I don't know. Thank you for having us. This has been a fun conversation. Yeah. I, I, I love the no stakes game. 